kind of um, the approach I'm going to uh, outline today has been sort of informed by two separate kind of ideas, really. Um, the first is that psychosis is a highly heterogeneous phenomenon. Um, and therefore, the attempt to come up with a single explanation of schizophrenia or psychosis or whatever we want to call it is likely to fail because there are so many different elements in that diagnostic category. And so we might make more progress by focusing on individual symptoms, um, such as paranoia. The second uh, guiding idea behind what I'm going to talk about is that actually the social environment is much more important in explaining these types of experiences than has been thought to be the case in the past. Um, and um, it affects us all, our mental health, every day, really. Um, psychotic symptoms are no exception. So I'm going to start by just, first of all, asking or just talking about a little bit about what I mean by paranoia. Um, throughout the history of psychiatry, there has been a very protracted debate about what counts as a delusional belief. Um, many people have attempted to find a way of drawing a line between delusions and other sorts of extreme beliefs, such as extreme political positions or extreme religious beliefs. I've become very skeptical about whether such a line can in fact be drawn. Uh, here we have Carl Jaspers, who of course famously uh, thought very long and hard about this issue. He noted that the abnormal beliefs of psychiatric patients tend to be bizarre, resistant to counter-argument and held with great conviction. But of course this is true also of uh, extremist political beliefs, for example. Um, Jaspers went on to say that a true delusion was not understandable uh, in terms of the patient's personality or background experience. What he meant by that was that no matter how hard you tried to empathize with the patient, that you would not be able to understand how they had reached this strange belief about the world. And therefore, Jaspers believed that true delusions could only be explained, by which he meant accounted for in some kind of scientific, presumably biomedical sort of explanatory framework. Um, I'm not going to say that there are no patients who have ununderstandable delusions, um, because I've not met every single deluded person in the world. However, I can say with a great deal of certainty that ununderstandable delusions are very rare, if they exist at all, that usually if we try and talk to the patient about their life experiences, uh, then we begin to get an inkling about how they've reached the kind of belief system which they confront us with in the psychiatric clinic. Um, and therapeutically, this means we need to approach the patient with the delusion in a particular stance, I believe, which is more or less to take the attitude that, well, what the patient is saying might be a bit weird, might seem strange to us, but it might just be true. Or at least some of it might be just be true. Or the patient might be expressing a truth in a bizarre way. And um, I believe that's an essential kind of starting point for engaging with patients and understanding where their beliefs come from. Um, when we look at the kind of beliefs that psychiatric patients have, it's notable that all of them in some way, the main themes in some way reflect concerns which we all have about our place in the social universe, the existential kind of issues which we have to deal with as we navigate our way from birth to grave. So um, we have concerns about our status with respect to other people. And that, of course, is reflected in grandiose delusions. We have concerns about the extent to which things around us are meaningfully connected to us, which is reflected in uh, delusions of reference. And then it's not difficult to see how jealous, delusions of jealousy or erotomania are also linked to core concerns which affect every single human being on this planet. But the most common type of delusion and this has been shown in cross-cultural studies, is the paranoid or persecutory delusion, 
Um, and this, of course, has to do with the extent to which we can trust other people around us. This is a problem which every human being has to solve pretty much every day of our lives. We are confronted with people, some of whom we know and some of whom we don't know, and we have to work out whether we can trust them or not. So um, these are just data from a study which I carried out with Nick Tarrier, um, Sean Lewis and others many years ago, which uh, actually Till talked about in her talk, um, the Socrates study. This was a large first episode sample. And what was um, important about this sample from the current perspective was that they, were all, what, they all had a mental state examination within two weeks of becoming known to psychiatric services and before they received medication. So they were a very good first episode sample. And these are their scores on the PANS when they were first assessed. And the bottom line really is very simple. That about 90% of them had marked paranoid or persecutory beliefs right at the beginning of their psychotic illness. And so we can say that paranoia or persecutory beliefs is almost ubiquitous in early psychosis. It's the most common feature of early psychosis. But of course, paranoid beliefs are not just held by psychiatric patients. Most of us have moments in our lives when we feel to some extent threatened by those around us, or at least we don't know whether to trust those around us. I was once asked by a journalist uh, who was interested in some research I'd been carrying out on hallucinations, whether I'd ever had a hallucinatory experience. And I said no, because I haven't. But I glibly remarked that having worked in a British universities for 30 years, I did have a highly developed sense of paranoia. Um, I was kind of making a joke, but there is an important point, which is that anybody who works in a large institution will find themselves at some point feeling that they don't know whether to trust superiors or people around them and so on. There is, in a sense, an optimum level of paranoia for any particular circumstances. So paranoia can be an adaptive phenomenon. Um, these are data collected by Dan Freeman, who has uh, done an enormous amount of research on paranoia over the years and who I've sparred with and debated with uh, over decades, really. Um, uh, Dan collected data on paranoid beliefs from a sample of about 1,000 people. This is just an internet survey. But you can see that when we look at the paranoia scores in this sample, we find the most common score is zero, that there are some people who don't feel paranoid at all. And, but as the, uh, we look at more and more severe levels of paranoia, we get smaller number of people. But the essential point is it's a continuum. When we look at a distribution like this, there's no obvious cutoff point where we can say that clinical paranoia begins and ordinary paranoia ends. But whatever line we, dry, we draw is going to be, to some extent, arbitrary. So Dan talks about the idea of a pyramid of paranoia, where at the bottom of the pyramid we have the sort of ordinary social evaluative concerns which we all have. Um, and at the top we have, more rarely, the very severe paranoid beliefs which we see in patients. Recently it's become possible to use sophisticated statistical methods to interpret data like this to see whether there is a genuine continuum or there is uh, or whether there are what we call taxons which are groups of people who are different qualitatively different than each other so these techniques are known as taxometric analyses and my colleagues and I have recently compiled data on a paranoia measure from a very large group of people uh, 2357 healthy people 288 prodromal patients and 360 patients with uh, psychosis. And we've used these taxometric analyses to actually ask this question, is paranoia a continuum or not? Now there's quite a bit of controversy in the statistical field about what, what is the best taxometric technique. So these days all researchers use more than one. We use three. And uh, just to give you a sort of idea about how this works, we've got these three analyses, MAMBAC, MAXAG, and L-MODE. Maybe the easiest thing is just to look at the top right, at the MAXAG results, 
they're actually the same as the results from the other two methods. So what we've done is um, this analysis generates a distribution of scores for the individuals in the sample. And the dark line shows the actual scores which were generated. The, on the left, you can see um, two lines which represent data from simula the, the, the scores of a simulated categorical sample. And on the right, you can see the data from a simulated continuous sample. And I think it's very easy to see that the true data fits the continuous the simulated continuous data, it doesn't fit the kind of data we'd expect to get if there was a taxon, if there was a separate group of paranoid people. And we get the same results if we look at the two other analytical techniques. And in fact, just for safety, we actually scored our paranoia measure in several different ways, and it didn't make any difference. You still get this result. The evidence very strongly supports a continuum model with no break between severe paranoia and um, and uh, uh, non-severe paranoia. And that's supported by other statistical methods which are uh, measures which I'll just skip over if you take my word for that. Now this has an interesting implication because if it's the case that paranoia is distributed in the community, so we're all capable of paranoia to some degree but some people are more capable of it than others, and if we were to expect, as I will argue, as I go on, that how paranoid we are is affected by social factors, then we might expect that the amount of paranoia will vary from community to community. We would find more paranoid places and less paranoid places. We've recently, my colleagues and I have recently carried out a mental health survey of 4,000 people in the northwest of England. For complicated reasons, this is called the Clark NWC Household Survey. I won't explain what Clark NWC means. There's a massive amount of politics involved. It's funded partly by the National Health Service, but also partly by local authorities. So it's a very complicated process setting up this study. But just to, the bottom line is we gave mental health measures and also a lot of measures of other factors to 4,000 people in face-to-face -face intervals, interviews and from selected deprived and non-deprived areas. And I just want to make a simple point for a moment that you can see these areas drawn on a map here of the northwest of England, and you can see that they just differ in how paranoid they are. There are areas where people tend to be more paranoid than other areas. And the differences are actually related to a number of factors, including social deprivation. You won't be surprised to know that people living in poverty and a situation where they feel quite powerless are more likely to have report paranoid beliefs than people who live in affluent neighbourhoods. But I'll come back to this later. The essential point I'm making is that we can think of paranoia geographically as well as something which is inside the individual. So how do we explain paranoia? Well, there are a number of psychological models which have been proposed. I proposed one myself a long time ago. It's actually one of my best cited papers, mainly because a lot of people have written papers saying why they think it's wrong. So there's a clue if you want to be highly cited, write something which everybody disagrees with. Um, I'm not going to go into my, the model at the time. Uh, an example of somebody who disagrees with it is Dan Friedman, my friend at Oxford University, who, um, Dan doesn't like the idea, my idea was that paranoia was partly a defensive process, that uh, you get to be paranoid by blaming other people for things which go wrong in your life, and that protects your own self-esteem. I still think there might be something in this, but I think it's true to say the evidence has not proved to be very strong for that idea. But nonetheless, if you look at the main theoretical models of paranoia which have been put forward, particularly my model and Dan Freeman's model, there's actually a lot of agreement about key issues. So, we agree that paranoia, the final common pathway, is overestimation of threat, social threat. A task which we all have to do as human beings as we go around the world is work out the extent to which we're being threatened by other people. Um, and paranoid people overestimate threat. We also agree that this overestimation of threat is affected by a number of cognitive biases 
of one sort or another, which I'll come to shortly. But these include a tendency to jump to conclusions on the basis of very little evidence, and also a difficulty in understanding the mental states of other people. We call this an impaired theory of mind, an impaired ability to read the minds of other people. And finally, most important from the present perspective, is that negative self-esteem, negative views about ourselves seem to play a crucial role in paranoia. And in fact, in some studies which I won't go into, um, we found that if you look at how paranoid symptoms fluctuate, to fluctuate over time, that people generally experience a drop in self-esteem before the onset of paranoid beliefs. Just to illustrate how these different factors come together, some years ago, some colleagues and I carried out a very large study of patients with a wide range of different kind of diagnostic status um, who differed according to whether they had paranoid delusions or not. We had some schizophrenia patients with and without paranoid delusions and some depressed patients with and without paranoid delusions, for example. We, we, we sought this mixed sample specifically so we could look at the determinants of paranoia. And we measured a wide range of different psychological factors. So we measured self-esteem and mood-related factors, but we also measured these cognitive factors such as theory of mind and jumping to conclusions. And we use structural equation modeling to understand the results, the relationship between these different, different factors. And the results were very clear cut and very simple. Uh, well, a bit more simple than that. I can simplify it down quite a lot. Um, it boiled down to this, that on the one hand, on the left of this path diagram, we see low self-esteem, a pessimistic interpretation of mood, and uh, of, of pessimistic interpretation of the world, sorry, and negative mood. So on the right-hand side, we have affective disturbance. And it, it's just all one thing, it all comes together. And the more affective disturbance there was, the more paranoid people were. So the more they thought negatively about themselves, the more they felt pessimistic about the world, the more paranoid they were. Now completely separate from that, on the left-hand side of the diagram, we have theory of mind, jumping to conclusions, and executive function. These are cognitive processes. And these were completely independent of the emotional processes, but they also contributed to paranoia. So the more cognitive impairment people had, the more paranoid they became. So how does this all come together? Well, very simply, really. Um, Max Coltart, a Australian psychologist, says that if you want to explain delusions, you need to explain two things. Where do the ideas come from? And why can't the person reason them away? So, where the ideas come from is the effective disturbance on the right of the picture. The effective disturbance creates these strange ideas in the head about being persecuted. Now, we're all capable of having these strange ideas. So, if you want to think of an example of this, which many of you will be familiar with, think of when you answer, when you open an email from a journal, from a journal editor, which says, Dear Professor Bentor, thank you for submitting your paper to our journal. We sent the paper to three or four expert reviewers. They saw many merits in your work. They liked this aspect of it. They liked that aspect of it. But, okay? And then it goes on to say, we found some flaws, and unfortunately, uh, we've got no space in our journal, so go away. Okay? How do you feel? Okay? What happens is you feel paranoid. Very typically, people will go, I wonder who the referees were. Maybe it was Dan Freeman. <laughs> or something like that. I know it wouldn't be, actually, because Dan and I are great friends. But, you know, that's the kind of thing. Then what do you do? You go away. You may, in this country, have a cappuccino. You sit back and you relax. And you think. And you realize that was a hard journal to get into. Maybe the paper wasn't your best paper. Maybe you could have analyzed the data better. 
So what's going on here? What's going on is on the left-hand side of the picture. You are reasoning your paranoia away. So if you can't reason your paranoia away, of course, you'll continue to think that people are trying to persecute you. So it's the balance between these two things which seem to be important in paranoia. The effective process, the insult, the feeling that you're being rejected, and, and which is controlled in most circumstances by the cognitive component. So I want to go on and talk about the effective component because that's what I've become most interested in in recent years. Where does this effective component come from? Well, paranoia is most obviously a disruption in the process of belonging to society, to other people. And it's been argued by American social psychologists and evolutionary psychologists that we all have a need to belong. There's a fantastic paper by Roy Bomeister and Mark Leary making the case for a need to belong being a fundamental human need. And they do something really clever. This is an old paper, this, but they actually spell out what they mean by a fundamental need. They say this need, the need must be shown, must be evident in all but the most adverse conditions. Today, as you've been going around in this meeting, you have been concerned about your need to belong, how you get on with your colleagues, how your career is going, maybe thinking about your wife or husband back at home and your kids. The need to belong is there all the time. It has effective consequences. Anybody here being divorced? I have. I can tell you that when there's a disruption to your need to belong, it can be very, very unpleasant. Um, and it can be so unpleasant that if your need to belong is thwarted, it can lead to disturbances of mental health, which I'll come on to later. Um, of course, the need of, to belong elicits goal-orientated behavior. If you haven't got a partner, you probably try internet dating or something like that. You're trying to find, uh, or you might, join us, you might look for friends or in the neighborhood or whatever. You're trying to find ways of belonging. It directs information processing. It affects a whole variety of behaviors. It's not related, it's independent of other motives. Uh, and it, it basically impacts on all areas of our lives. So the need to belong is fundamental. Robin Dunbar, a evolutionary psychologist, has argued that human beings have an optimum social network. So Robin Dunbar has looked at different primate species Primate species are remarkable for the extent to which they form bands or tribes which collaborate together for their own mutual benefit. And Dunbar has argued that the, one of the forces propelling human evolution and the evolution of the human brain has been this need to relate to other people because other people are complicated. Other people are the most complicated thing you'll ever meet. So... We need powerful brains in order to relate effectively to other people. We use up an enormous amount of our brain power on the whole process of relating and belonging to other people. Dunbar has even extrapolated from the primate, primate data and estimated the optimum size of a social network for a human being, which is known as Dunbar's number now. It's 150. So, Human beings do well if they have about 150 relationships going at any one time. Of course, not all relationships are the same. It'd be horrible to have 150 husbands or 150 wives. Make life very difficult, I think. Um, so we have a small number of very intimate relationships. Around those, we have close friendships. Sort of people you would go to a bar to so, and have a little weep when you, things go wrong and they would listen to you and, and look after you. And around that is an affinity group. These are the people who you might meet at other people's dinner parties. And then finally, there are acquaintances. And these are people who you don't know all that well, but if you met them in the street, you'd stop and have a little chat. So, how do we sustain these relationships? There are two known mechanisms. One is attachment processes. Here we have John Bowlby, who, of course, is one of the great geniuses of psychiatry and psychology, um, who pointed out that the quality of our relationship with our parents 
when we're young provides a model which we internalize and carry forward into adult life and it affects our relationships in adult life. Actually, Bowlby's model is about trust, actually. It's about how you form trusting relationships. If when you're young, you feel protected and safe, you can go forward into the world and explore, safe in the knowledge that there is a safe haven to go back to. It's all about safety. Less well known is this person, Henry Tajfel, who was a social psychologist. Tajfel spent a lot of time thinking about broader groups. So he was interested in what we call social identity, how we define ourselves according to the groups that we belong to. So, all of you belong to groups. If I were to go around and ask you a question to, about yourself, maybe I'd say, please describe yourselves, you wouldn't give the kind of answers that you would find on a self-esteem questionnaire. You wouldn't go, well, I think I'm a person of moderate worth, or something like that. No, you talk about the groups you belong to. So you'd say, I am a psychiatrist, or I am from Milan, or uh, I am a Manchester City supporter, and so on. You define yourself according to the groups which you belong to. What Tashfell showed was that people will form these identities ridiculously easily. So one of the experiments he did was he showed people a sheet of paper full of dots, hundreds of dots. And he just asked them to guess how many dots there were there. He gave them one second to do it. They had to look at it and guess. He put the paper away. It didn't matter what their answer was. At random, he told them that they were either overestimators or underestimators. And then he got them to start thinking about what the other group was like. And very quickly, people who thought they were overestimators, of course, this was just decided at random, but if they thought they were overestimators, they would say things like, well, you know, underestimators are probably nice people, but I think they're a bit mean. You know, that, and they would go on and deliver elaborate theories about why underestimators were not as nice as overestimators. And the overestimators would do the, well, the underestimators would do the same. So we form groups very quickly on the basis of almost no, no reason whatsoever. And as soon as we do, we start disrespecting people who don't belong to the same group. And that's called outgroup derogation and helps to explain racism and things of that sort. Um, recently, there's been quite a lot of evidence which shows that the more groups we feel that you belong to, and the more we have a real sense of belonging, it's actually quite an emotional thing. The more we emotionally relate to those groups, the better our mental health is in terms of common psychiatric problems. So people who belong to a lot of groups are less likely to become depressed, and there's even some prospective evidence that if you are a member of a lot of groups, going forwards, you are more resilient to stress. And of course, this might help explain one particular interesting phenomena in terms of psychosis, which is the ethnic density effect, which is that if you, um, so if you belong to an ethnic minority, you have an increased risk of psychosis, but m only if you live in a neighborhood which has few people of the same ethnic minority status. So a black person in Britain living in a white neighborhood has a five times increased risk of psychosis, something like that. If they live in a black neighborhood, they don't. And that's probably something to do with this identity process. So both attachment and both identity, they both end up by affecting our self-esteem. The higher, uh, the more groups we identify with, the more securely we are attached, the better our self-concept, and the more resilient we are against um, psychiatric symptoms. And, of course, remember that self-esteem is an important factor in paranoia. So what's the evidence? I don't know how much, how much I've not... I'm doing 15 minutes. Okay, great. Um, I forgot to check my watch. Um, okay, so let's have a look at some evidence now, okay? So what about attachment? So many years ago, 
about 10 years ago, I got really interested in the idea that the social environment plays a big role in psychosis. And I've done quite a lot of work in this area, including a meta-analysis, which I won't talk about today, but in the meta-analysis, we found that children who had traumatic childhoods had a very greatly increased risk of psychosis in adulthood. It it's basically triples the risk of psychosis in adulthood. One of the things which we became interested in is the possibility that different types of early traumatic relationships, events, sorry, produce different symptoms in adulthood, that there might be a pattern between the different types of traumas in early life and the types of symptoms which people experience when they be develop psychosis. These are data from the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey, which is a, um, an epidemiological sample of, of 7,000 UK citizens. And they were asked about traumatic events in childhood, including whether or not they'd been raped before the age of 16, or received any other types of sexual, unwanted sexual approach, whether they'd been physically abused, whether they'd been bullied, and then we had two variables which related to separation from the parents. So one was called institutional care. Institutional care is being brought up in a children's home. The other was local authority care. That in fact means being fostered, being raised by foster parents. Now what's important about these is this. Remember, I talked about attachment. You can be pretty sure that somebody who's raised in institutional care has had a very damaged early attachment relationships. First of all, you only ever get in institutional care if something has gone very wrong with your relationship with your parents. Maybe the parent has been highly neglectful or been abusive in some way. But also, institutional care is awful. The kids who live in, our, in my country anyway, it's a scandal that the quality of care provided to, to kids in these institutions is very poor and actually they often get abused in various different ways in those institutions. So institutional care is a signal of really damaged early attachment relationships. Whereas local authority care isn't so much because the foster parents can to some extent repair the attachment relationships. What we looked at was the relationship between these different types of childhood experiences and paranoia and auditory verbal hallucinations. And because they tend to go together, people who have one often have the other, we use sophisticated statistical models to control for that effect. So this is what we found. We found that uh, institutional care massively increased the risks of paranoid symptoms in adulthood by a an odds ratio of about 11. Um, and none of the other types of childhood trauma had a specific effect on paranoia. We also find, by the way, which is not really part of my talk, but we also found that childhood sexual abuse massively increased the risk of hallucinations. Uh, specifically, the other types of childhood trauma didn't have such a strong effect on hallucinations. We have some ideas why that might be. Of course, this is only one study, so you might argue that um, maybe it's not representative. Actually, we've replicated this finding in a number of different samples. So this is a recent study which looked at prisoners in England and Wales. So there was a psychiatric survey of prisoners in England and Wales, 3,000 plus prisoners who were interviewed about psychiatric symptoms and also about childhood experiences using very much the same kind of measures as used in the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey. The lead author on this was Mark Shevlin at uh, Ulster University. He analysed the data in a slightly different way, but it gets, you get the same result. So, first of all, um, so what he looked at in the case of, uh, he looked at those who'd been raised in institutions as children, people who'd been brought up in children's homes, and he divided those prisoners into those who had paranoia only, those who had hallucinations only, and those who had both. And you can see that being raised in a children's home increased your chances of being in the 
paranoid category or the both category, but it didn't increase the risk of hallucinations on their own. So again, we find that being raised in a children's home increases the risk in paranoia in adulthood. And incidentally, we found the same relationship between sexual abuse and hallucinations. What's remarkable about this sample is that the time, at the time that they were being interviewed, they were living in traumatic circumstances. They were locked up in jail. And even though, so you'd think that would obscure these effects, but even so, we still found the same effects. So we think this is kind of evidence that disrupted attachment in early life increases the risk of paranoia. Now, if that's true, it should, what, part of the pathway should be a disturbed attachment style. Attachment style is the way which you relate to people of your own age, which is influenced by your relationships, your, your childhood relationships with your parents. And Bowlby developed an elaborate theory of this, of different types of insecure attachment. But you can measure attachment style in adults using simple questionnaires, actually. So we went to another epidemiological data set, which was the US National Comorbidity Survey. In that survey, they didn't ask people whether they'd been raised in children's homes, so we couldn't look at that. But what we did find was the neglect by parents was specifically related to paranoia, which again makes sense in an attachment framework. But we also found, because in this study, they actually got people to fill in an attachment questionnaire, which had three scores. Attachment avoidance, so attachment avoidance is avoiding other people, close relationships with other people, because you think they're not safe. Um, also attachment anxiety, which is avoiding relationships with other people because you think you're not the sort of person who they will love. And also we had a secure attachment measure, which is the opposite of those two, obviously. Anyway, as you can see here, it came out very clearly that insecure attachments, both attachment avoidance, attachment anxiety, lack of secure attachment, predicted paranoia and the pathway was, it was part of the pathway from neglect. So we think this is quite strong evidence that attachment is specifically linked to paranoia. Of course, these are epidemiological samples and you might say, well, what about patients? So uh, one of my PhD students, Sophie Wickham, uh, compiled we managed to, we've been giving out attachment questionnaires to patients for a long time in various different studies and we'd never bothered to analyze them. Sophie got all the data together and we ended up with 173 patients. And what we found was attachment anxiety and attachment avoidance predicted paranoia as measured by the PANS, but it didn't predict hallucinations. The effect was very specific to paranoia. We also found that that process was partially mediated to, by negative self-esteem. So that supports the idea. What we're looking at here is a chain of events, disruption of early attachment in childhood, leads to an insecure attachment style, which leads to low self-esteem, which leads to paranoia. So we now have evidence from uh, three epidemiological samples and also a large group of patients. Of course, you could argue, well, all of this is cross-sectional. Is it causal? Do we know it's causal? Very difficult to demonstrate causality. I always say to my students that the only way you can really prove causality is if you get an affidavit from God, where God promises that it's causal. You can never have a completely certain proof of causality. However, we've tried to show that attachment varies according to uh, over time and that your attachment insecurity predicts paranoid symptoms. And we did this using a method of experience sampling where people wore digital watches which bleeped 10 times a day. These are patients and controls. And we had them record how paranoid they felt at the time. And we also had them, we got them to answer some questions about attachment insecurity. And I guess I'm running out of time, I'll skip the details, but basically what we found was, first of all, people's attachment insecurity fluctuated over time, and secondly, as they be felt more insecure, then they felt became more paranoid. The insecure feelings of attachment 
predicted an increase in paranoid symptoms immediately afterwards, in the 90 minutes afterwards. So we think this is beginning to show that yeah, we have quite good evidence for causality. I'm going to finish by saying, talking about identity, going back to identity. Um, we've only recently begun to collect evidence on identity and paranoia. So uh, these are all preliminary results. They're not published yet. Oh, no, there is one published one. Sorry. We carried out a study in, uh, well, our first study, I'd forgotten about this one, was carried out uh, actually by uh, Justin Thomas, one of my previous, uh, one of my former PhD students in the um, United Arab Emirates in a place called Zayed College um, with female students. Now, the important thing about this college is that everybody's taught in English. So, and the other th thing is that the Emirates have a huge, uh, there's a huge influence of American culture. So what we did was we measured the extent to which the students identified with Arab culture, which is the culture where they were born into, versus American culture, which they had all around them. We also measured their competence in English. They're all raised speaking Arabic originally. Um, because we know from previous studies that language is closely linked, linked to identity. I think Napoleon said a nation is a language with an army. Well, you know, a culture is not much different in a way. It's all based, it's, it's related to language. We used a, something called an effective priming task. People were shown symbols related to American and Arabic culture on screen. And then they were shown either good or bad words. And they just had to say whether the word was a good word or a bad word. And they had to respond as quickly as possible. And the idea is that suppose you have, a, say, a negative view of American culture, or a, well, then what will happen is that it'll, when you see an American flag and you're shown a bad word, you'll be able to respond very quickly because you've already begun, the flag has made you have bad thoughts, basically. It's a priming process. So we looked at how people respond to Arab symbols and American symbols. What we found was, I don't know if this, I think this might amuse some people, I don't know, but what we found is the more that the students identified with American culture, the more paranoid they were. And the less they identified with Arab culture, their culture of origin, um, the more they identified with the culture of origin, the less paranoid they were. So, so here we have an example of people who are identifying with a culture which is not their own, and it seems to be making them uh, feel paranoid. We've also looked at, uh, I'll make this the last uh, study I go into, I'll skip the last, I've got two more, but I'll just do this one. Remember the survey I carried out, we carried out with uh, 4,000 people in the community in the northwest of England. Well, we measured um, all sorts of things, including how paranoid they were, as I've said already. We measured self-esteem. Um, and we also asked people how much they thought they belonged to their neighborhood. It was only a single question. So this is a kind of limitation of the study. But we asked people how much do they think they belong to their neighborhood. Um, we also asked them to, to list the number of local societies and clubs they belong to. These are just the straight correlations. So if you look at column four, that's paranoia. And you can see that it correlates with neighborhood identity negatively. So the more people identify with their neighborhood, the more they feel they belong to the neighborhood, the less paranoid they are. There was a lesser correlation, quite a small correlation, with multiple group uh, membership. The more groups they belong to, the less paranoid they were. And also we found, as we'd found many times before, that the lower the self-esteem, the more paranoid they were. So in a way, this is quite a small effect, but it's showing that belonging to your neighborhood is associated with not being paranoid. And we went on to analyze these data using multi-level models. Um, we're just about to submit this to publication. Um, so we looked at the pathway from neighborhood identity through self-esteem to symptoms. So with symptoms we could look at were depression, paranoia, and hallucinations. And we thought identity would affect the first of these two because we know that they are related to self-esteem, 
but we expected no effect on hallucinations. And that's exactly what we found. We found an effect through depression that neighborhood identity affected self-esteem, which affected how depressed people were, and a similar effect for paranoia. But we found no effect for hallucinations at all. And that's exactly what we predicted. We had no reason to think that identity would affect um, uh, hallucinations. Now, I'm run out of time. I did have one more study to talk about which used kind of more sophisticated measures of identity, but just to say that we have re replicated these findings with other types of samples, uh, and again, we're writing those up. And one of the interesting things, it seems to be, in a study we've carried out with students at university is that uh, identity seems to protect people from stress. So that the more they identify, uh, university students identify with their own university, the more they feel that they belong to them at their own university, the less they're affected by things like financial stress. We measured, you know, if we look at the amount of debt students have, if they don't identify with their university, then if they have a lot of debt, they tend to become quite paranoid, but not if they do identify with the university. So I'll come to the um, conclusions. Bonds with other people are a very powerful source of well-being. Um, so um, the extent to which we are at ease in intimate relationships and relationships with our neighbors affects our, uh, our, 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 our well-being, and particularly in the, paranoid, in the psychosis domain, paranoid symptoms. The effect was no effect for hallucinations for either of these processes. Um, there's clearly an implication for therapy. Um, sometimes therapists, when they talk to patients about this sort of thing, because therapists often do, sometimes a common thing to say is, well, go and join a group. But it, do, it doesn't really work. Um, if you've tried that, you'll have discovered it doesn't really work because it's not joining groups which counts. It's feeling that you belong to groups. And there's a particular set of skills in learning to make those kind of close bonds. And two Australian psychologists, Alex and Kath Haslam, have been developing a group intervention actually for depressed patients, which actually builds up those skills. It's called Groups for Health. And one of the things we'd like to see is whether this helps paranoid patients. We think it, it will do. Two other, I just want to make two other very quick points. First of all, one of the huge implications of the idea that paranoia exists on a continuum is that a small effect at a social level can have a huge effect in terms of prevention. So, remember those neighborhoods differ in the level of paranoia. What would happen in those neighborhoods if we could shift the average paranoia score just by one point? Okay, the number of people with extreme paranoid beliefs would probably drop dramatically. We don't know that, yeah, we're going to test it, but that seems very likely. So, Things which we can do to make resilient neighborhoods, to make people get on better with each other, to improve social relationships and group membership and things like that, are things which will make us all feel better, we'll all live happier, but will also hopefully stop, reduce the amount of mental illness which comes to the attention of psychologists and psychiatrists. The reality is, don't get me wrong, I'm for having an army of psychologists and psychiatrists, but Doing things like this, trying to build better societies, will have a much greater effect on mental health than having a million psychologists and psychiatrists. And that's something we ought to do. And that, the reality is that, that gets you, you, you're getting closely into politics at this level. But I think, in a way, we need to, particularly in the difficult times which we live in at the moment. Just on that note, I should just point out, I voted Remain. Um, and finally, just one point, thank you. One point I believe very strongly about. Yeah, you wouldn't believe how hurt people like me in Britain feel at the moment. Um, because our sense of belonging has been damaged. Uh, finally, attachment and identity has other implications, not just within the psychosis domain. Remember, I started with the problem of how can we dis distinguish between a delusional belief and an extreme political belief. And maybe we can't very easily. The case of Anders Breivik shows that it's very difficult to tell the difference between those two. It's interesting if you look at Breivik's life. Okay? Breivik had a terrible early attachment experiences. He was a kind of poster boy for the model of paranoia I'm describing. You can't read about his childhood without, without choking, actually. It's horrible. 
And his solution was to try and develop an identity in adulthood, which led to disastrous results. And actually, there are other former leaders who've led the world to disaster who kind of have the same profile. So this whole work around attachment and identity may have implications which go well beyond the field of psychosis. Mm -hmm.